Okay, now you're good. Okay. Okay, friends, um, I'm sorry for the slight delay, the technical difficulties. So it's a little bit of a somber subject. I usually try to pick summary, exciting, historical subjects for our summer lecture series. This year, because of the pandemic, and um, I spent a lot of time accompanying families during grief. I spent a lot of time uh, during funerals, shivas, shloshims. There was a lot of mourning involved and it's such an essential part of my life. And uh, there's some thoughts that I wanted to share and um, share with you and really looking at our set of laws, uh, not just as a set of traditions, but really as a healing process, really as a healing process. Uh, in addition, very often we approach this subject in our most difficult times of our lives. Um, at the moment when we're starting to discuss, well, what are the Jewish traditions of burial? What are the Jewish traditions of mourning? What is the Jewish traditions of, of Shiva? It's at the moment when you lose one of your closest people. And at that time is not really an easy time to learn. So how do you say goodbye Jewishly, according to Judaism? Um, what things perhaps could we know in advance that could help us for ourselves when we approach other families who have sustained a loss, or if we have lost uh, someone in our families, or, and really, at, essentially at the end of the day, it's a question that every single one of us, how do we prepare uh, to say goodbye? Okay, the last moments, the last moments of a human life. And here really the words of Jacob to Joseph. Jacob is asking Joseph, this is a Rembrandt. Jacob is asking Joseph, please do me mercy and truth, kindness and truth. The mitzvah of Livaya, the mitzvah of dealing with the deceased is the mitzvah called chesed shalemet, a kindness of truth. And Rashi explains why is it mercy shown to the dead is a mercy of truth? Why? Since one cannot hope for any reward. Since one cannot hope for any reward. It's considered the ultimate kindness a person could convey, a person could show, because essentially um, the person you're doing kindness to cannot give you kindness back. So in a way, the kindness we show to the deceased is the ultimate, is the, called the kindness of truth, because it's in a way it is true altruism. I shared this story on Yom Kippur. And for me, this was probably one of the most powerful stories that happened to me during the pandemic. Um, one of the most difficult things during COVID-19 is that during March and April of last year, many families did not have the opportunity to say goodbye to their loved ones. Um, very often people spend their last few weeks in isolation. And there was a family, there was a funeral of a very dear member of Parkey Synagogue that I officiated and the, the widow told me, the wife of the deceased shared with me that she wasn't able to see her husband of, 50, of a half a century for the last three weeks of his life. And one nurse was kind enough to arrange a FaceTime just for a few moments uh, for the family to be able to connect. But then after the passing, after the passing, a nurse she had never met before sent her a message, a letter saying that although saying that although um, saying that although I've never met you before and I've never met your husband, but when your husband was dying, I saw that he was alone and I decided to hold his hand. So I didn't want him to die alone. And this act of humanity and kindness uh, touched her tremendously. And it's interesting that the Shulchan Aruch writes the following. It's a mitzvah. As soon as he feels death approaching, they should not separate themselves from him lest his soul depart whilst he is alone. There's a... Sorry. 
Any second, I'm sorry. Just show your screen, whatever you have open. So you have to have open the open the I'm sorry, just give me a second. You should know when uh, when I got my rabbinic ordination. This was not part of the training. Mm -hmm. So you have to forgive me for it? Yes, just open it. Yeah, open it there. And now, so you'll show you screen. Okay, I think we have it now. Second. Okay. This is the Rembrandt that I was speaking about it just a moments ago. Again, there's a prohibition to leave someone when they're dying. There's a prohibition. We try to escape death. We try to avoid it. But in Jewish law and Jewish tradition, is actually considered a very special moment. If you, have a, if you have a loved one who's dying, not only that you're, it's better not to leave, you're forbidden from leaving. You should not separate yourself. You should make sure the human being does not die alone. For the soul suffers grief when it has to leave the body alone. And it is a religious duty to stand near the dying person during the departure of the soul as it is written. That he should still uh, live a way that he should not be, see the pit. Quote from Psalms, for the seat the wise men die, the fool and the brutish together perish. Again, so again, the Shulchan Aruch writes this as an essential religious aspect. This is not just uh, in terms of decency of kindness from your perspective, but in addition, this is a very special moment and we'll speak about the moment of the departure of the soul uh, at the end of this lecture as well. In addition, there's actually a tradition um, some even try to have a minion. You know, you always have a minion for anything, for any spiritual gathering. You want to pray, you need a minion. You want to say Kaddish, you need a minion. Uh, some people even try to have a minion at the departure of a soul. Uh, the Brisk dynasty, the Soloveitchiks, were very, very careful to have a minion at the time of the departure of the soul. One of the great Soloveitchiks in Israel, um, he was actually, every time he thought he was about to die, he called his entire family in. So he was doing it once, twice, three times. And one of his nephews responded once, I'll come this time, but it better be the last time. But the truth is, it's not a joke. The truth is there is something about, it's called Sha'at Yitziat Nishama, the moment of the departure of the soul. And again, the tradition during the departure of the soul is to recite the same verses we recite at the end of Yom Kippur. Shema Yisrael Hashem Elohim Hashem Echad, Baruch Shem Kivon Machuto Lolam Va'ed, Hashem Elech Hashem Alach Hashem Imloch Lolam Va'ed, and Hashem Hu Elokim, Hashem is our God, uh, we say seven times. The same exact thing we say at the end of Yom Kippur, traditionally, when possible, when permissible, we recite it at the time of the departure of the soul. Once a human being reaches the moment of goses, meaning that the person is actually departing, it is forbidden, according to Judaism, to cause anything that will hasten the death. Therefore, a person should not even, uh, according to Jewish law, you shouldn't even touch the person, perhaps lest you will hasten the death. Rav Shlomo Zaman Urbach clarifies again that to hold someone's hand, caress their hand, and gent uh, gently hold it as they're dying is excluded from that. That is permissible even at the last seconds of a human life. So again, 
uh, again, speaking about not letting someone pass alone. Now, there are a few important things that we're not going to discuss tonight, but it is essential for every person of faith and specifically any traditional Jew to think about these things, to think about these things in advance. There are advanced directives of what medical care you want given to you. And in uh, traditional Jews give advanced halachic medical directives. So you have either you write a living will where you personally prescribe what's the care that you want to administer to you, or you, or you have a healthcare proxy who is designated to make those decisions on your behalf. But it's important whether it comes to questions of DNR or DNI, um, do not resuscitate, do not intubate, uh, there are cases in Jewish law where that is permissible. It's rare, but there are cases. Um, again, in Jewish, in Jewish law, we do everything to do, even chayei sha'a, even to give a few moments of life is of extreme importance. But there are cases where one is not obligated to intubate. So again, very often people will write in their directives that they want to be administered within accordance to Jewish law. And again, within Jewish law, there's a very clear separation of church and state. I'll say over here between medicine and state. Doctors have the full authority to make any medical decision on behalf of the patient. We rely solely on doctors to make the medical decisions necessary to heal a person. But the questions of ethics, what is a life worthwhile saving? What is, uh, in what case, is it permitted not to give some artificial nutrition is it permitted not to intubate? In many cases, that is not a medical decision. That is an ethical question. And when it comes to ethical questions, it should be within accordance of your uh, value system. And different countries have different value systems. And we as Jews, we prescribe to our traditional value system. And again, pain control, use of morphine, uh, in general, it is permitted, even though sometimes um, uh, morphine could uh, if it's given for the sake of alleviating pain, it is permissible, even though at times um, it, it could uh, bring, uh, it, you know, it's not, it's not it, uh, correct. But again, it's all these things, whether you could be an organ donor, at what point could you be an organ donor, in what cases are, is autopsy permitted, and when it is forbidden, these are very, very lengthy uh, issues. Each one deserves a class in its own, but it's important to research for yourself uh, to take the time and God willing, you shouldn't have to use it for a very, very long time. Now, the next, the following is very important. Before a person, very often, and actually yesterday, I was called by a family member to come say parting prayers with someone who's about to pass away. And this is a very important for every person who's listening uh, to know because very often a rabbi is not going to mention it. Even when a rabbi is coming to say departing prayers, a rabbi is not going to mention it and I'll explain why. And this is comes to the vidui prayer, the vidui which is a confession. Um, at the end of our lives, we're preparing for the most important meeting of all. So right now we're preparing for the high holidays. The high holidays in a way is a mini meeting with our creator. Uh, it's the time of the year where we are closest to, uh, to God. On Yom Kippur, this is when we beseech God for another year, for an extension of our lives. Um, and we recite the vidui, we confess for our sins and we ask for forgiveness. The most important meeting is the meeting when we conclude our life mission, we're preparing to meet our creator. Before that, uh, it is proper for one to say the vidui, to say the confession. However, Many halachic authorities believe that it's, it's uh, and it's not just related to the vidui, it's very important not to mention to a person who's ill, who's dying, anything that could aggravate them more. So for example, you have to be very careful if you're having, if someone is, uh, uh, you know, at their final moments, very often the family is gonna start uh, making phone calls, okay, we need a cemetery, we need a plot. You're forbidden from having these conversations in presence of the person who's dying, because that is going to aggravate them, uh, whether you don't know exactly what they could hear, what they can't hear, what they understand, what they do not understand. Sometimes they have to remind the family that's balancing uh, preparation and care for their loved ones to walk out of the room 
to have certain conversations. Similarly, um, even though it is proper for a person to say a confession, if it's going to aggravate a person more, we do not remind the person to say. So very often it is upon the person who's party to remember for themselves. And I just want to read with you, this is the Rabbi Sachs translation of the, there's the long confession that we say in Yom Kippur, the al with the knocking on the, on the chest. Usually when people are about to die, they're not in a position to say the entire bidu. This is a short version. I acknowledge before you, Lord, my God and God of my ancestors, that my cure and my death are in your hands. May it be your will to send me a perfect healing. Yet if my death is fully determined by you, I accept it in love at your hands. May my death be, my, be an atonement for all the sins, iniquities, and transgressions I have committed before you. Grant me of the great happiness that is stored up for the righteous. Make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. Your right hand bliss forevermore. Avi Tomim, father of orphans and justice of widows, protect my cherished family whose souls are bound with mine. Into your hand, I entrust my spirit. May you redeem me, Lord, God of truth. Amen and amen. Be ado of kidruchi. The final words in Adon Olam we say every, at the end of the prayer on Shabbat or in the morning that when we start our prayers, I entrust my spirit in your hand, Lord. This is the vidu. So if you're able, and every one of us will come to that moment in our lives, you could ask the people, please say the vidui with me. You should ask for it. Because if you're not going to ask for it, very often they're not going to want to say it with you, not to aggravate you. So again, this is a pretty morbid subject, but since there's never a good time to talk about it, I think it's an important to share. However, if it is... For some reason, this is showing. Okay. How do I hide this bar? Does anyone know? No. No. What? Excellent. If you cannot say the entire vidui, you say these words. If I die, may my death be an atonement for all my sins. And if you cannot say it, you think it. Again, it's, it's, a more, it's, it's an important subject. If you, can, if you could say it, may my death be an atonement for all my sins. If you cannot say it, you think it. The next subject. Praying on behalf of the sick. So we always pray, we say the Mishaberach, uh, we say the Mishaberach for the sick to heal those who are in need of a, a refuash lima. There's a great debate whether at some point, if someone is, is um, if doctors say this is, um, this is the end, there is no cure. This is an incurable situation. Is it permitted to die? Is it, is it permitted to pray for God to take someone quicker to alleviate pain? Is it permitted? And, and again, very often, when we were with someone who's, who's dying, first of all, we're in the hospital. Um, so there's a discussion, there's a debate whether a person, it's not a debate, but um, for example, very often a person is connected to a catheter. Are you permitted to pray to God if there's in the presence of a catheter? So again, if it's just a, a liquid catheter that's there, if it's covered, um, it, you are permitted to pray actually there. You just make sure the catheter is covered as well. You are permitted to pray to God. But there's a very... Uh, 
very authoritative opinion of the Ran, who quotes from the Talmud where the, uh, the servant of Rebbe, who is the prince uh, of, uh, uh, Rab Rabbi Judah the prince, was the author of the Mishnah. Um, his servant prayed for him to die when she realized that he's not going to uh, have a full cure. And hence, uh, both Rav Moshe Feinstein and, uh, and the photo of the Arucha Shulchan, of Yechiel Michal Epstein, two very authoritative figures quote that for law as well. There is a point where one is permitted for God to take someone away that they shouldn't suffer more. That is a permissible prayer. Uh, Rav Lazer Yudha Valdemarg, who is very often um, a contemporary of Moshe Feinstein, or Moshe Feinstein lived on the Lower East Side. Blazer Yudha Valdemarg was one of the most authoritative uh, halachic opinions in Israel. He was the member of the Supreme Rabbinic Court in Israel. He writes, one should pray that God should do as is right for him, as God feels right. He did not feel comfortable with this prayer. But again, this is a subject that very often people at the final moments you pray for something that you feel guilty for praying it, it's important to discuss it as well. After a person dies, um, we approach the, the aspect of burial. And in Judaism, burial is a great mitzvah. And it's actually the, it's taken from the curse that man has received after the first sin. By the sweat of your brow shall you get bread to eat until you return to the ground. For from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. It's very interesting that when Adam was given the curse, that by the sweat of your brow shall you eat bread until you return to the, to the land where you were taken. Um, this is where we learn that a person should be returned to the ground. We're taken from the ground and we return to the ground. And again, um, obviously, uh, cremation is uh, extremely seen extremely negatively in Jewish law, um, but there are ways. If when you study the Talmud, they discuss that different ways of burying in the ground, and for a lack of space, sometimes they had they had rows in the ground, meaning uh, they were able they buried uh, within floors, uh, within within caves. Uh, so there was many ways, but the many ways of burying in the ground until today. In Israel, some of these methods are being used. There are two reasons, two major reasons given in the Talmud why a burial in the ground is so important. A dilemma was raised before the sages. Is burial obligatory on the account of disgrace so that the deceased should not suffer the disgrace of being left exposed as his body begins to decompose? Or is it an account of atonement? so that the deceased will achieve atonement by being returned to the ground from which he was formed. The Talmud has two reasons for being buried, to avoid disgrace, the dignity of the human being, but also being buried is a sign of atonement. How being buried is a sign of dignity. It's, Rav Salvechik and many others have given an example, that for example, when, when your mezuzah is out of use, where a Torah scroll is out of use, what do we do with the Torah scroll? We bury it. We put it in Gniza, we put it in the ground. We're forbidden from destroying it. We return it. And then the ground, nature takes its course. And obviously it's not something that remains unless it was in the Cairo Gniza and then it, it survives for a, a thousand years. Um, but essentially it's, it's being disposed with respect. A human body, a human being who has done mitzvot, a human being who has lived with the divine spirit within him is like a Torah scroll that is out of commission. A human being is like a Torah scroll that cannot be read anymore. And therefore it has to be handled with the ultimate respect. And therefore, just like you bury a Torah scroll, when a human being completes their, their task in this world, we give the respect of a Torah scroll that is out of use. Now, how would it relate to atonement? Why is burial uh, also an act of atonement? Because in essence, burial returning, you know, when I spoke to many people who are concerned about burial is because they're concerned about the idea of decomposing in the ground. Uh, but essentially, the agreement to burial 
is giving yourself over to God, is letting go, is letting go. And we like being in control. The Egyptians th thought if they could mummify someone, they will remain. Judaism, part of, uh, part of the atonement is letting go, is acknowledging God is our ultimate master and giving ourselves back to the ground, giving our bodies back to the ground and not trying to fight uh, what is to happen later is part of that process of atonement. This is, uh, this is I think it's a Monet uh, sunset. When a person dies, uh, one of the great questions is when to have the funeral. And there are two very important, uh, two very important values, which often contradict each other. On one hand, according to Jewish law, a Jewish funeral has to take place as soon as possible. And we learned that even when the Torah speaks in Deuteronomy, you must not let his corpse remain on the stake overnight, but you must bury him the same day for an impaled body is an affront to God. You shall not defile the land that the Lord your God has given you to possess. This is actually a verse speaking of people who got the capital punishment. Even if you receive the capital punishment, your body should not be left out to decompose. Every human being has dignity, even a person who received the capital punishment. This source, uh, the same day, so therefore definitely for righteous people, our will is to, as soon as possible, to bring them to burial, out of respect, but also out of closure. Um, and if possible, very often it's difficult, if possible to do it the same day, that is always preferable. But there's another very important Jewish value when it comes to the funeral, and that is the following. If one left his deceased relative unburied overnight for the sake of his honor, his or her honor, for example, in order to assemble the people from the neighboring towns for the funeral, or to bring in professional lamenters, professional lamenters. It used to be, uh, again, in some Sephardic communities, um, when I grew up in Moscow, in the, uh, the Jews of, from the Caucasus Mountains, I, I participated in funerals. You had women who cried over the casket in a very powerful way, and it's in a very, it's a very difficult way. It's part of a, a, some a tradition of some communities. And it was during, a, you know, it was during the times of the Talmud as well. Or to bring him a coffin or shrouds. He does not transgress the prohibition of his body shall not remain all night. As anyone who acts in such a manner does not only, uh, does so only for the sake of honoring the dead. This indicates that the eulogy and other funeral rites are performed to honor the deceased. So again, if you're waiting for a, an only child to fly in from San Francisco, uh, this is in honor of the deceased to have their child to be able to give the eulogy. So these are two very important values. You have to have the funeral as soon as possible, but you have to give them the proper honor. So again, these are often contradicting and sometimes the funeral has to be delayed a day. And sometimes it's delayed too, again, but you have to keep in mind, you can't forget, you have to keep the balance between these two very important values. The next part, and this is where there are many instances where Jewish traditions are not in line with common practice in American society. Um, Jewish burial is supposed to be very simplistic. And uh, listen to this story from the Talmud. At first, taking the dead out for burial was more difficult for the relatives than the actual death. Dealing with the funeral costs was more difficult than the actual death because it was customary to bury the dead in expensive shrouds, which the poor could not afford. The problem grew to the point that the relatives would sometimes abandon the corpse and run away. This lasted until Rabban Gamliel, who was the president of the Jewish community, came and acted with frivol, meaning that he waived his dignity by leaving instructions that he be taken out for burial in linen garments. And the people adopted this practice after him and had themselves taken out for burial in linen garments. Rav Papa said, and nowadays everyone follows the practice of taking out the dead for burial, even in plain hemp garments that cost only a dinar. Again, 
A Jewish bril has to be very simplistic. The body is cleaned, simple white shrouds. It's an even shrouds. Everyone are buried with the same clothing. This is already uh, 1600 years in practice. Again, it's a sense of equality, but also there's a very important lesson. A Jewish burial is there to take attention away from the body and to focus on the soul. How many of you have ever been to Moscow? Okay. I grew up in Moscow a few minutes from the Red Square. This is in the Red Square. The center of the Red Square is Lenin's mausoleum. It's one of the most awful places you'll, I ever visited in my life. I once, I once went through there and I washed my hands uh, for 10 minutes after I exited the mausoleum. This is Lenin's body that's being preserved since 1924. So this is showing respect in so Soviet tradition. In Jewish tradition, this is the greatest punishment that a person could receive. Again, it, I, think, I think the Russian government till today spends, uh, I think over a million dollars a year preserving his body. Um, again, trying to hold on to the body. He's in a, an expensive suit and a tie and a Egyptian cotton shirt. In Judaism, again, this is the opposite of what we are supposed to do. Um, in Israel, actually, they bury someone just wrapped in a talit. In America, they, uh, outside of Israel, it's barely, uh, most communities actually use a plain pine box, but it's a simple pine box. Very often people spend money at a funeral out of a sense of guilt. You can't pay back to the deceased. You could pay it forward. The moment the person dies, the body has to be returned with dignity but again, the focus is not on the body. The focus is on the soul. Once, a, once there's a death, from the moment of death until the moment of, of the completion of the interment of the burial, a human being is called an onain. An onain is a person who um, is, it's a very interesting, it's an extremely unusual state. One who suffered a bereavement for whom he is a duty bound to observe mourning writes, uh, he eats not meat nor drinks wine, nor does he recite the benediction before meals, nor does he say grace after meals. You don't say hamotzi and you don't say birkat mazon. Even if he eats with others, he should not repeat amen after them. And he is exempt, he and she are exempt from the performance of all the mitzvot, all the commandments in the Torah. This is the only time that a Jewish person is exempt from doing mitzvot. Rabbi Samson Raphael Hirsch explains, this is an acknowledgement of the sorrow of the human being, but in addition, this is to, for, to give the person the absolute ability to focus completely on giving the proper honor to the deceased. Your mitzvah before you is to bury the dead and to be busy with that, to write a eulogy, to make the arrangements, to notify the friends, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. You are exempt. And listen to this. And some say that even if he desires to adopt for himself a stricter view, to recite the benediction. What if someone says, "I know I'm exempt from saying the blessing. I know I'm exempt from saying Birkat Hamazon, but I want to do it anyways. I want to do mitzvot anyways." They're not permitted to do so. You're forbidden from doing mitzvot. You're obligated. Again, this is. An extreme, this is the only time that a person is completely absolved from doing the commandments of the Torah. But it's interesting, even when you're uh, the Pitre Tshuva writes, although the Onen is not required to the Onen is not required to recite the blessing before or after the meals, you're obligated to wash your hands before and after the meals as the rabbinical enactment. Uh, uh, you know, for when it comes to hygiene, especially during the pandemic, you don't have to say the blessings, you always have to wash your hands. But then he makes a very important clarification. An onan is exempt only from the positive, but not from the negative precepts. Just FYI, you're not permitted to go steal, rob a bank while you're waiting the funeral because you're exempt from all the commandments in the Torah. All it means from all the positive commandments, you're exempt. Again, the laws of aninut do not apply in the Sabbath because there's no mourning on the Sabbath and there's no aninut on the Sabbath. But during the weekdays, the first day of a death, you do not put on filling, you do not do, you do not say blessings, you do not pray, you do not do any of the commandments in the Torah. 
The next commandment is the eulogy, the mitzvah of eulogy. Who do we, who's the eulogy for? And again, the Talmud discussed a dilemma was raised before the sages. Is the eulogy delivered for the honor of the living relatives or for the deceased? Of the deceased or it is delivered in honor of the dead? What difference does it make? What happens if the person who died wrote in his will or said, he or she said, I do not want to be eulogized. If the obligation to eulogize is for the honor of the deceased, the deceased should have the right to waive. But very often the eulogy is not just for the deceased, it's for the family as well. And if it's for the family, the deceased does not have a right to prohibit his children from saying goodbye. So again, the eulogy is not just about the deceased. The eulogy is also about his loved ones, his or her loved ones who want to have the ability of saying goodbye. Actually, very often it happens every, I hear this story every couple of years. One of the great rabbis in Israel passes away. He writes in his will that he doesn't want to be eulogized. Very often they go ahead and eulogize him anyhow in any way. It's interesting, you're forbidden from having eulogies on holidays. For example, today was Rosh Chodesh. You're not supposed to have eulogies in Rosh Chodesh. But even so, we always find a way to use a eulogy. A eulogy has to be positive. And again, in modern culture in the United States, I've been a few times when people actually think it's funny to say things that are not respectful to the deceased. That is not permitted according to Jewish law. There's a time and place for everything. And there's no obligation to be funny in a... In, in a you could, it, sometimes there are anecdotes that could be funny, but there are certain things that I felt at times that were inappropriate to be stated at a eulogy. Um, and I think it's important to know uh, because it's, it's there to give honor to the deceased, honor to the family. But in addition, a eulogy is supposed to inspire people uh, to become better. We're using death as an opportunity to grow. Death in Judaism is used as an opportunity to grow. Shiva. The moment the burial is complete, we approach the Shiva. This painting is by Shagal, correct, Dr. Roses. This is a painting of Joseph mourning uh, Jacob. And it says, it's the first time it says that mourning, and he observed the mourning when he came to Golan Hatad, a mourning period of seven days for his father, Genesis. Chapter Nun Pasuk Yud. And even though Joseph mourned for seven days, it is not a biblical commandment. Maimonides writes, you can see at the bottom, it is a positive commandment to mourn for one's closest relatives. And mourning is not based on scripture except for the first day, only because it's the day of the death and the day of the, fu of the funeral. But the rest of the seven days are not Torah mandated. And Moses, our teacher, established the seven days of mourning and the seven days of celebrating for Israel. This is something that, um, second, just wanna make sure it's working. Um, so, so again, it's Moses enacted the Shiva. It's a very, very, uh, this is not a new tradition. This is from the times of Moshe Rabbeinu. It was enacted by Moses, but Joseph observed seven days of mourning for his father. The mourner's meal. And it's very interesting. The mourner's meal, uh, it's tradition to have an egg or to have lentils. Usually it's around, it's around food for a few reasons. Uh, life is a circle, the circle of life. But in addition, it doesn't have a mouth. Sometimes a mourner feels like they cannot speak. They cannot express themselves. But another point, the mourner's meal ideally should be provided not by the mourners, but by their family and friends. Sometimes even if there's no one, Parkis, Toby, Toby will usually ask, do you have a mourner's meal? Do you have someone to provide a mourner's meal for you? Listen to this, Amar Abiyuda. Abiyuda said in the name of Rava, mourners on his first day of mourning is prohibited from eating of his own bread. You know, it reminds of a way on Passover Seder, you're not supposed to pour your own wine. You're supposed to, someone else should pour the wine for you out of a sign of freedom. 
But here it's similar from where it is derived from that, the merciful one says to Ezekiel, and nor eat the bread of men, which indicates that other mourners must eat bread made by others. It was related that when Rabbi and Rabbi Yosef were in mourning, they would exchange their meals with each other. Um, they're all preparing a meal, but they prepared a meal for each other. They exchanged. Again, we want to use mourning as an opportunity to connect people. We want, you, you should be, you should feel embraced. There are moments in life when you need to feel embraced by friends and family. Even people who like being independent need to be taken care of. Um, and, and this is essential. And this is shown by the first meal. And usually this is the meal when the mourners come back from the funeral. And as they come home, there's a meal awaiting them. Where does sit Shiva? You know, uh, there's, a, there's a joke that a woman once calls the rabbi three o'clock in the morning. And the rabbi answers the call. The rabbi is half asleep. And he says, who's there? He says, it's Rachel. He says, Rachel, how could I help you? He says, rabbi, I'm sad to inform you that my husband's brother passed away in Israel. By now, the rabbi is already awake. He says, I'm so sorry for your loss. Um, uh, how did this happen? They speak for a few minutes. He says, how could I help you now? Rachel says, Rabbi, I have a very important question to ask you. Where should my husband sit Shiva? Should he sit Shiva in Israel? Or should he sit Shiva in New York? The rabbi says, that's a, that's a great question. Why don't you want to ask your husband? Where does he want to sit Shiva? And Rachel says, Rabbi, it's three o'clock in the morning. My husband is sleeping. Okay. <laughs> Where do you want to sit Shiva? So it's very interesting. Where are you supposed to sit Shiva? Ideally, in the Sefer Chachmat Adam writes, in the name of the Ramban, in the name of Nachmanides, that the Abelin tzachim litabel b'makom shesa nishmato. Ideally, you're supposed to sit Shiva at the place where the human being died, or if that is not possible, where the, where the person lived. Today, most people eventually die in the hospital. So that's obviously you cannot sit Shiva in the hospital. Uh, but... Ideally, you're supposed to sit Shiva at someone's home where they die. However, this is also waived for the sake if where the person lived is not a place where you could receive people, it's not a place where people could come visit, or it's far away from where uh, your friends and family live, you are permitted to sit Shiva somewhere else. Because again, the responsibility and the idea of being able to be embraced by your friends and family and community is supersedes this tradition, this law. And the blessings one is supposed to say when you, uh, when you leave, second. Do you sit Shiva for adopting parents. So if your parents adopted you as a child, or you only sit Shiva for biological parents. And again, this is a long conversation, but there's an example from the Talmud in Berachot, where Aban Gamliel sits, accepts condolences on behalf of his servant who has passed away. And his students asked him, how do you, uh, uh, how do, you do so? And he responds that my servant Tavi is not like the rest. He was special to me. And so, yes, if you are mourning the passing of a loved non-biological parent, you could sit and accept condolences on behalf of them and say Kaddish on their behalf as well. There is, um, a, there is a proper way to express your feelings and emotions, even when it's not with real parents. Proper Shiva visit etiquette. And this is very important. This is a photo of President Herzog at a Shiva visit by a, a, a rabbinic family in Jerusalem. And Shiva, it's very interesting. Um, this is not such a well-known law, but the Shulchan Aruch writes, the comforters are not permitted to open a conversation until the mourners open first, opens first. And as soon as the mourner nods his head in a manner from which it is indicative that he dismisses the comforters, they are not permitted to remain seated by him or her. It's very interesting. Uh, in addition, uh, why are you not supposed to start speaking when you come to Shiva? Why aren't you supposed to open a conversation? 
What happens if you come to Shiva home and the mourners not speak? So the commentators explain, when you're coming to visit a mourner, it's not about you, it's about them. It's not about what you wanna speak about, it's about what about they wanna speak about. So you have to take the lead from the person who's mourning. First, when you come to mourner's home, listen. Is there something, usually mourners at a shiva home, um, I actually, I see this almost at every single shiva home. The mourners will repeat three, four, five stories 50 times. It's like, an, it's a cathartic experience. They'll repeat it every day sometimes. Very often they want to speak. You have to take the cues from the people who are sitting shiva. You could only comfort someone once you know what pains them. But if the mourner is not speaking and obviously it's getting awkward, of course you're permitted to make your best effort. If you're not sure what to say, don't say it. Definitely don't say something that could cause pain. So you have to be sensitive. If you see that the person is exhausted or they're tired, you have to know when to leave as well. If you're sitting shiva late at night, unless you know the person wants you to be there, make sure to leave in time. And very often it's a social event. There are 50 people in a room Sometimes you have to look at the mourner. Maybe it's time to call to close the party to an end. You have to be sensitive to the mourners. And again, you know, sometimes mourners ask me, um, you know, I have 20 people in my house. Do I have to entertain them? I'm like, no, you don't have to entertain them. They have to entertain you. And by the way, it says an, as an example that even if the president comes to pay a shiva visit, you're not obligated to stand up. So it doesn't matter who shows up at your shiva house. You um, are there to receive comfort and not to entertain or to comfort others. This is the photo of Rav Avram Yitzchak Cook, Kuk, the first chief rabbi of Israel. And I want to share with you a fascinating story. Uh, I read in a great book where much of the material I'm sharing with you today is from Rav Rimon. He quotes from another book that when Rav Kuk was sitting shiva for his mother, he was crying the entire shiva. And people tried it to comfort him. And it was very difficult for him to receive condolences. And someone asked him, Rabbi of Cook, why are you, aren't you receiving condolences? Your mother lived to an age of almost 90. Your mother saw her son be the chief rabbi of an Israel that is in the process of being reborn. Why are you so unconsolable? He says, I have many titles. I may be the chief rabbi of Israel, but no one will ever call me again, mein kind, my child. And therefore I cannot receive any condolences. Don't try to diminish a person's pain in a shiva. Don't try to mitigate, say, well, it's not so bad. You should never do that. Because it doesn't matter how Oh, the person was a thousand years old. Baruch Hashem, the person was healthy. There's nachas. Everything is good. Givaldic, no. Because for the person who's mourning, no one will ever call them again, mein kind. Um, and it doesn't matter how old you are. If no one will again call you my child, that is a very powerful thing. So don't mitigate the person's pain. How to greet during Shiva. It's interesting that they're, you're not really supposed to greet someone, uh, say hello, shalom. Uh, shalom means God's name. Well, today, uh, they say, how are you doing? If it's a casual, how are you doing? Many opinions say that that is okay. Uh, you know, today they say, you know, it's a nudnik. You know, it's a nudnik? What's a nudnik? In Israel, they said, nudnik is someone who you ask how he's doing and he starts to answer you. You, you know, so a casual... Uh, a, a casual, how are you, uh, is, uh, is, is not the, it used to be that when people blessed, people said hello to each other was a blessing with God's name. Again, this is some of the things that are, uh, that are prohibited to do during a shiva. Wearing fresh clothing, taking a haircut, shaving, playing or listening to music, participating in joyful activities, sitting on regular chairs, working, 
bathing for pleasure, using cosmetics, lotions, wearing leather shoes, engaging in intimate relations, or studying Torah, you're forbidden from studying Torah. Torah brings joy. These are the things that are prohibited to do. And these laws, which we cannot discuss in detail in this forum, are designed to give the person the focus, the ability, and the strength to come through it. Correct, but even that is questionable. Um, again, you study Mishnayot with the name, but it's limited. You study laws of mourning. You're sp- you could say Tehillim, but you're limited in terms of what you're supposed to do. You're not, you're not supposed to engage in Torah study during Shiva. Rav Soloveitchik wrote a fascinating, Rav Soloveitchik wrote, and I, I tell this to every mourner um, who comes to ask questions about what to do in specific situations. There's the letter of the law, but there's the spirit of the law. And every mourner has to use their judgment at some point. And he wrote the following. Mourning in essence is a mourning in the heart. And our laws designed, we have 11 prohibitions that are supposed to give a framework to our mourning. You're supposed to be in a state of sadness. And imagine, imagine if you have a mourner who's not going to shave, not going to work, not going to wear leather shoes, but at the days of mourning, he's going to invite games. He's going to make a bingo game in his home, invite his friends. He's going to invite a comedian who's going to make show. Technically, he kept all the 11 uh, prohibitions in the, uh, in the, he kept the letter of the law, but he missed out on the spirit of the law. So again, you have to make sure to keep the spirit of the law of mourning as well. That's where Absalavichuk writes. Is it appropriate to eat at a shiva house? So it's very interesting. Rav Kiva Eger wrote, Noagim shlolikach davar katan vegadol. Ashkenazic tradition, not to take something small or big from a shiva home. Mishum shiruach evel kol meshach shiva, tuma shorah sham kol shiva. That there is a spirit of, of impurity that's among, you don't want to take anything from a shiva home. So the, the Rav Kiva Eger is the one you see who's dressed like you would be dressed if you're in Prussia. He was a rabbi poser. Uh, you know who's the Ashkenazic rabbi by the warmth of the clothing that they're wearing, okay? So Rav Kiveger is going to be, um, he's at my right. To the left, you have the Ben Ishchai of Baghdad. And the Sephardic tradition is the opposite. Not only that it's not good to eat at a shiva home, but it's great to eat at a shiva home because every blessing you make elevates the soul of the departed. And it strengthens the sense of community and it brings people together. So it's very interesting if there's one thing that the Ashkenazic Jews were influenced by the Sephardic Jews and New York Jews were definitely influenced by Sephardic Jews when it comes to eating. And it's interesting to see how against the sense of community and camaraderie overrides some of the traditions in order to accommodate the ability of friends and family to be together. And that's how the, uh, the whitefish started. And listen, this is essential. This is, if, this is probably the best thing. If you came here only to hear this piece of advice is the quote from Proverbs. King Solomon writes, Nu shechar le'oved v'yayin le'marei nefesh. And uh, Shulchan Aruch in Yoreda writes that you're permitted to have some wine as well. The mourner. And the Yemenite Jews were, it, it was their tradition based on King Solomon's words, give strong drink to the hapless and wine to the embittered that it's, it's a good opportunity to, take, uh, to have some alcohol during a shiva. So it's greatly advised. Uh, and I've told, share with some good friends of mine, uh, it's a good time to take the schnapps out and to hape, uh, help. Again, you don't want to be in a state of drunk. You don't want to be avoiding your feelings, but it's okay to take a drink of wine as well. Could you perform a shiva vis-a-vis email or calls? And again, it's discussed by modern post and by modern halachic decisors. Throughout the last year and a half, many of our shiva visits were reduced to calls and emails. It is not the ideal form of shiva. There's nothing like an in-person meeting. I don't care what you tell me. Uh, You could visit Paris in person, and then you could go on Google and go search for the Eiffel Tower and press Google images and look at the photo of the Eiffel Tower. And it doesn't matter 
What's the level of resolution of your screen? It is not the same thing. It's not even the same to watch a movie on your computer, to watch it in theaters, or to watch a play in person. It's not the same to listen. I don't care how good your stereo is. It's not the same to listen to classical music on, uh, on uh, 105.9 WQXR or sitting in Carnegie Hall. Even more so when it comes to comforting. There's nothing like giving a hug to someone who lost a loved one. If you could make a visit in person, there's nothing that's better than that. But again, in moments when you can, an email and a call is also, is also permitted. One of the traditions of a shiva is to have a shiva candle lighting the entire seven days. The candle, again, resembles the soul of the human being. The candle of God is the soul of man. And we light a candle, again, to focus on the soul and not on the body. And the neshama is eternal. And often what gives us comfort is knowing that the neshama, that the soul is eternal that the good deeds a human being did are eternal, that the love that the love that your loved one imparted upon you is eternal. And that's what is symbolized very often by the candle. When you have a child that is born, you start lighting another candle on Shabbat. Very often, many people have the tradition to light an additional candle for every child. We light a candle for a deceased at the Shiva throughout the entire Shiva, in addition to the yurt sites that come afterwards. This is... Again, we started with Jacob and we're going to end with Jacob. When Jacob was dying, he calls his sons together and he uses those moments to give blessings to his children. The last moments Jacob used to tell his children things he could perhaps could not tell them throughout his lifetime. And he told them, he has fu lechem, gather and let me tell you. And the Midrash discusses what did Jacob want to tell his children? In those final words. The Rabbanan Amre, listen to this, the Midrash writes, Tziva otan ala machloket, Amar lehon tiyu kulchon asifa achat. He told his 12 sons, do not fight. Please be one, be united. Na'asu b'nei Yisrael agudachat. And the sons of Israel became one unit. Very often, a death is able to bring a family back together. Very often, I've seen it many times, both personally and by friends and family, that a death has brought people together. Very often, it's an opportunity to sit down on a low chair, sometimes after siblings have not been sitting together for decades, whether it's because of geography, because of life, many things happen throughout. Shiva is an opportunity to heal. If there are six, th six things that I think that Jewish laws of mourning teach us, number one, that the laws of mourning are not only for the deceased, but is perhaps mainly for those who are living. That's number one. Number two, the laws of mourning are designed for one to face the loss and emptiness and not to avoid it. Again, in American tradition, very often, people do not want to participate in the actual burial. Very often, people only come to the interment, to the cemetery, after the casket is already lowered and sometimes even covered. In Jewish tradition, you have to face death. Facing it is part of the closure. It's part of the healing, not avoiding it. Don't run away from a person who's dying. You have to be in there. You cannot, there are certain parts of life that may be uncomfortable and may be difficult, but are absolutely necessary for you to be able to move on and to heal. Number three, the laws are designed to properly channel the grief and sorrow while not being completely a succumb to grief. Number four, the laws of mourning are designed to focus on the soul and not on the body. Perhaps that's also why we don't have we cover the mirrors in the mourner's house. Number five, the laws are designed to integrate the community and friends and avoid solitude. Whether it's through food, whether it's choosing a shiva home to accommodate people to visit, you shouldn't be alone. 
And I think number six is the most important. The laws of Avelut are designed to use death as an opportunity to uplift, to learn and to repent and to grow instead of falling. I have seen people emerge from a mourning process stronger. I've seen people who've strengthened, many people strengthened their faith, their commitment to family, to tradition throughout a mourning process. Very often I've seen people become better parents, better friends, and better spouses, and better children after and during a mourning process. Mourning is able to change your life and not just to remember the death. Thank you very much.